There are some people who believe that um, witchcraft is as old as the human race, um, even in primitive societies. It was um, usually the case that someone more knowledgeable than, than the other tribal members seemed to have um, information that you know, ordinary people didn't have and they could influence the lives of the, the tribe. Um, a classic example of this is the cave paintings in uh, the south of France where um, a, a hunt of animals would be either described, as some archaeologists reckon, or perhaps hopeful that the outcome would be as, as shown in the, the paintings. However, fast forward to the arrival of the Roman Catholic Church, um, because this became a, a matter for the church authorities in time. The Catholic Church arrested and tortured witch witches uh, using the Spanish Inquisition. If suspects recanted and returned to the fold, they were accepted. If not, execution was by burning at the stake, usually alive. When the Reformed Church of Scotland came along in 1560, the Reforming Fathers got rid of all things Papist except witch hunting, which the Reforming Fathers pursued with distinctly unjust fervour. The reason for this? To control the people under the new religion. The Witchcraft Act of 1563, passed by the Scottish Parliament and signed by the Papist Mary Queen of Scots, led to sporadic hunts. Only a few witches were brought to justice in the beginning. Then came an attempt on the life of her son, James VI, in 1590. A coven led by Francis, 5th Earl of Bothwell, called the North Berwick Witches, led to the deaths of many of the 140 adherents. When James published his demonology in 1597, it led to the first epidemic of the witch hunt. Clearly, the good burghers in Aberdeen believed that if the king said it was all right to burn witches, then they could. And the first outbreak took place in 1597-1598. It went on longer in Scotland uh, than in England. Um, in fact, when James VI became James I of England, in 1603, the first thing he asked to do was to look at the legislation on the disposal or the treatment and disposal of witches, and he said it was far too lenient. So he strengthened Elizabeth I's Act, which was also passed in 15, um, 1563. Um, the English Act differed from the Scottish Act in the, in the sense that only if a witch was proved to have caused the death of somebody was she or he executed. Um, in Scotland, it was totally different. If you were found guilty of necromancy, witchcraft, the black arts, um, necromancy being consulting dead people, i.e. spiritualism, there was no doubt as to what the outcome was going to be. Although the act, one of the shortest in the, the rule book and or the statute book in Scotland, um, it's very specific, and but it's not specific about the, the punishment. Um, it also interestingly said that any person who didn't believe in witchcraft was also guilty of witchcraft, which in Scotland denied witches the, the assistance of a lawyer to, to, to disprove the, the, um, the accusations. So it was pretty one-sided, and although in the beginning there were official trials, usually held in Edinburgh, um, they were finding witches in every corner of Scotland, bar the northwest of Scotland, where the Catholic Church um, was still holding sway, although surreptitiously. And of course, the people in the northwest of Scotland believed in the little people, and all you needed to do to uh, propitiate them was to get some holy water and sprinkle it on your doorstep. That wasn't good enough for the authorities in Edinburgh. You know, they had to bring 
uh, exponents of this of the black arts to to justice, and they had to be suitably uh, treated, punished, and until the the late seventeenth century, the verdict was usually guilty and execution. I think I could spend a half day explaining it, but I think the easiest way of describing a witch is anyone you didn't like. Usually, um, witches were old, elderly, but the young were not, didn't escape either. And they were usually sexual objects. But as a good guide for witches, anybody you didn't like. Usually working class people were, were um, the, the main source. It's very rare for uh, titled people, although there were one or two that, that um, were, were indicted for witchcraft um, and most of them got away with it, you know. But um, as, as to the main suspects, uh, beggars, midwives, servants, both domestic and farm workers, especially those who spoke sharply to their employers or were se se sexually harassed by them. Beggars were, were a particular uh, target because they were the uninvited guests at christenings, wed weddings and funerals, seeking alms and cursing those who refused them. Usually what happened was if a beggar cursed someone in the churchyard, um, something not very nice would happen, fall ill or maybe even um, died and uh, the family would remember that they'd been cursed by the beggar in the churchyard and the beggar was immediately apprehended and, and brought in for questioning. Curiously enough, midwives were vulnerable, especially those who allowed newly born but sickly children to die without baptism. Because if a child went to, if it died without being baptized, it was said to, its soul was said to go straight to the devil. So they were particularly vulnerable in their job and probably doing the relatives uh, a favor by letting the children die because they were either badly deformed or badly ill and probably wouldn't have survived anyway. Um, serving girls were also fair game for, for men, um, and the male, the male defence was often, you know, oh, she bewitched me, she smiled at me, she had sparkling eyes, she had lovely long hair, um, this sort of thing. Uh, so, um, and women were regarded as unnatural people, uh, they were regarded by the church as closer to nature, which they didn't like because that meant they were closer to the old pagan gods um, that were discredited by Christianity. And of course they had moods, usually every month they had funny moods, you know, and men didn't understand that, however. Um, the majority were lowly working class folk who, in the course of a domestic argument, like whose turn was it to sweep the stair in a tenement, they would curse their neighbour saying, no, I did it last week, it's your turn. And they'd, the other person would argue and the first person would probably say something like, well, devil take you because I'm bloody telling you the truth. Then shortly after, perhaps some illness or death would happen for no reason to the other person's family. And that was excuse enough for the wronged party to report the existence of a witch to the local minister. Well, first of all, uh, the reasons for the witch hunt was really all about controlling the population. And the church saw putting the fear of God into them was the easiest and quickest way of doing it because all everybody was expected to attend church. One classic example of a, a, 
which has been cited of a, a, a witch or the presence of a witch is not attending church. Um, and that could have been for all sorts of reasons, illness or no transport or living in a remote cottage, you know. Um, so, you know, the, 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 the Kirk believed that uh, if you weren't attending worship regularly, then you were up to no good. However, um, the first epidemic, um, which I mentioned earlier, was in 1597-98 in Aberdeen. And curiously enough, I've, I've done a, 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 a comparison of the epidemics with the geographical uh, situation in Scotland at the time um, to see if there were any unusual occurrences like bad weather or bad harvests. And 1597-98, plague and famine were foremost. And of course, witches got the blame for it. Because um, the, the population of Scotland at that time were largely land workers. And of course, if you interfered with the food chain, you were up to no good. So witches were accused of stopping up mills. They were accused of putting stones in front of the ploughs and all this sort of thing. Uh, hens stopped laying eggs. Cows dried up. It was all the fault of witches. So the stage was set for um, investigation, shall we say. Um, before we go on to that... Um, the second epidemic occurred in 1628-32 to 32, and plague was again present in Scotland. The third epidemic is very interesting. It lasted from 1640-49. to 49. The trials were increased when the church and the state were ruled by the Covenanter Party, um, who later broke free from the Church of Scotland and, and founded their own um, very strict and rigid um, uh, form of religion. They were the people who had signed the National Covenant in 1638 in protest at Charles I's attempt to impose the English Book of Common Prayer and bishops on, on the Scottish Church. The General Assembly of the Church of Scotland urged ministers to preach against witches and at one point said that it wasn't the devil who was sending witches to persecute God's chosen people, but God himself. This was aimed at sinners, backsliders, and of course those who feared that there were members of the population hankering after a return to the old Roman Catholic Church, which was discredited. And the fourth and final epidemic of 1658-62 to 62 was purely political. Trials increased after the end of the Commonwealth imposed in Scotland by Oliver Cromwell. Incidentally, Oliver Cromwell didn't believe in witches or witchcraft, and after the Battle of Dunbar in 1650, and he arrived in Edinburgh, the first thing he did was freed all the people that were in the toll booth, including the witches, because he didn't believe in witchcraft. He thought it was superstition. So um, he also suspended the Scottish Parliament, and he suspended the General Assembly of the, Scot the Church of Scotland. So for that period from... 1650 up to his death in 1658, the cases of known witches just hung on the on on the bow, and um, but people didn't forget that they had a witch living among in their in their community. So as soon as Cromwell, the authority of Cromwell, all the surfaces that had been simmering away since 1650 came to the fore. Also, um, when Charles II was restored in 1660, he passed an act of pardon in favour of Cromwellian supporters and witches. However, his act did not apply to Scotland. So when the Scottish Parliament was re reconvened, prominent on its list of priorities in 1660 was the witch hunt. Fast forward to 1688 with the accession of William of Orange and Mary Stuart after James VIII was deposed because he was a Roman Catholic. The witch hunt was virtually over by this time. This time. Acquittals were far more common, with doctors and lawyers supporting those accused of witchcraft. 
although there were occasional outbreaks. However, in the period between 1563 and 1727, when the last witch in Scotland was burnt, no fewer than between three and a half and four and a half thousand people, 80% of them had been women, were judiciously murdered for the imagined crime of witchcraft. Uh, from my um, research in the region of about 50, um, it varies because some witches are described as being in Pencaitland, others in Ormiston, and even Winton, which is my knowledge of geographical knowledge of Trinet is not very good, but I believe it's very small. So um, I would say in the region of 50, but not all of these were executed. Obviously, the first thing was to report the suspect to the church, and the Church of Scotland had a very ingenious way that would have found favour with a certain Chancellor of Hitler in, uh, of Germany, i.e. Adolf Hitler in 1933. They had what was like a ballot box, and all you did was you wrote the name of the suspect on the, on the piece of paper and dropped it in the ballot box, and you didn't have to say who you were. So as soon as the local beadle got the got messages in the ballot box, he informed the minister who and then called the presbyteries together. And in those days, everybody in the community was known to the church, and their habits were known, their lives were known because the church, at that time, interfered with the private lives of people like like never before. I mean, the Roman Catholic Church, if you had a sin to confess, you sinned it in private to the priest. But sin in the Church of Scotland was a public thing, and it meant you had to sit in the stool of repentance. So it was in the Church of Scotland's interest to encourage people to give the names of sinners and heretics. And heretics included not only Roman Catholics, but witches. Anyway, what would happen would be the presbytery would be convened and they would send a court or they would send a church officer to apprehend the, the person or persons and they would be brought in for questioning. Obviously denials were common uh, because the population knew just what would happen if you were found guilty of witchcraft. But the church um, had its own way of getting a confession, because only until it got a confession could it ask the civil authorities to intervene. So what they would do would be they would take the, the miscreant into, into custody, um, take them and put them in the church steeple, which was a secure place, and they would often make them wear hair shirts and they would be fed a diet of bread and water. But the worst um, feature of the, the softening up process was sleep deprivation. And how they did that was they had um, shifts of Kirk elders that worked eight hours on a, sh a shift so that the witch was, or the suspected witch, was awake for 24 hours a day. And psychologists will tell you that if you're denied sleep for even as few as three or four days, you'll admit to anything. And that's what, was ha that was, that's what happened. Just to get sleep, the, the woman, which it was usually a woman, would admit that she had dealings with witchcraft. Uh, as soon as they got that um, confession, they handed the individual over to the civil authorities. Um, only the civil authorities could um, use torture instruments, and they used them quite freely. Um, I'm not sure about the situation in Trinent, but certainly in Dunbar, there was a prison, an official prison, and they had a jailer who... Um, was entitled to use torture instruments on suspects. Uh, again, the civil authorities, like the church, would say, if you confess that you're a witch and you confess your coven, the names in, uh, of the, those in your coven, you'll probably get a lenient sentence. So, of course, people were quite happy to name, name other people in the hope that they were going to get set free. Uh, this was just a ploy. Um, and 
who did these other, who did these women nominate or name? Usually people they didn't like. So that all kinds of people were, were hauled in for questioning. Um, usually they stopped when they got to 13 because that was the, the magic number for a coven, although they went in some cases further than that in extreme cases. Torture instruments were um, quite severely controlled by the Scottish Parliament and, uh, and its um, instrument, the um, Privy Council. But the, the most common in political cases was racking. Uh, you were put in a frame and tied into this frame and they turned the wheel and literally racked your body, which pulled your arms and legs out of their sockets. That was not usually used in witchcraft um, torture trials uh, or torture um, as a result of trials. What witches got uh, done to them was um, uh, thumb screws um, known as pilney winks. They fitted over your screws and they just kept tightening them um, until the pain got so severe. Um, another another way of um, torturing a witch was the, the Branks or Scold's Bridle. Um, Scold's Bridle was a, a, an open helmet and it was cruciform and it had a mouthpiece that if you tried to talk it had prongs on the bottom. But as soon as you started to talk the prongs went into your upper mouth and it was very painful and there are examples of the school there is an example of a school's bridle in the at the door of the kirk and um goodness me my memory is garvel church and there is also um another form of torture where if you were indicted for witchcraft but not considered dangerous enough you could be chained to the kirk wall with a, a collar, an iron collar. And there is one at Spot Kirk still to this day. Um, it wasn't only witches that got uh, caught in this, it was adulterers and guys who had had um, lots of women that weren't, they weren't married to. And it's still there to this day. The other torture that was commonly used in witch trials was um, taking in the local jail and having heavy iron bars placed on your legs, which are stretched out uh, and maybe supported by a, a stool or something. And they just kept adding another bar until the person was screaming with pain and, and begged them to be taken off. And um, they would then say, well, if you admit you're a witch, we'll take them off. Uh, the other um, common thing was and I can't, I can't describe it even. It was some instrument that um, squeezed the shoulder blades, and it's all written in Old Scots, shudder blades, and it burst the body out of, out of its bones for some reason. I've tried to work out what it was, but it did result in blood being spilt. And finally, the removal of fingernails. That was known in some cases, but not, not common, but it was known in some cases. Usually the local lock, locksman, um, he was called the locksman because he was the jailer, so he had the keys to the jail. But he acted as jailer, um, torturer and executioner, certainly in Dunbar. Um, the trial would usually consist of um, a, a, a judge who was usually a landowner and a heritor of the church. So if the person was a, a domestic farm worker, um, it was in, in his interest to get, get to the truth, execute the person, so that his other workforce would say, oh, well, our Lord has, has got rid of the problem, so we'll stay with him because there was a famous case in Samuelston, which is near Haddington, where Samuelston doesn't exist to this day. There's only about a couple of barns there in its place, but no fewer than 40 people were arrested for witchcraft. 
and reported to the Earl of Harrington, who owned the property, and every one of them was executed except one. She was kept in prison for a year, and then the authorities decided that they were going to let her free because it was costing too much money to, to feed her. But that was the kind of thing that went on. Um, so the judge would have uh, maybe a fiscal, a procurator fiscal with them, but there was no jury. Um, instead, they had witnesses, and there were cases of maybe involving 40 or 50 witnesses who had had some experience of this woman um, and felt in their heart of hearts was a witch, but were not prepared to go that far to indict them in case the witch came and gave them um, some of the benefit of her, her knowledge, usually a spell of some description. But in a public trial, they knew that they would, they would get the protection of the civil authorities. And the outcome of these trials was usually execution. I mean, it was invariably um, a hanging offence in England, certainly, and in Scotland it was strangulation, and then the corpse was buried because a witch, a, 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 a person found guilty of witchcraft, was not allowed to be buried in sanctified ground. So this was the reason for the burning. Although there were cases in Edinburgh, particularly in the North Berwick witch trials against James VI, where some of the ringleaders were actually cast into the fire alive. Usually they were taken to the local place of execution. Um, in the Edinburgh trials they were either executed mainly in, on the Castle Hill um, and in Leith at uh, Shrub Hill. Um, so these were the, the local spots. But normally if a, a trial was local it would be held in the local, um, the local execution site and the one in Dunbar was, um, is, is known today as Gala Green, but it's a corruption of Gallows Green. And basically what was, was put up there would be, a, sometimes it might be a, a gibbet, other times it might just be a, a platform where the individual was wet or strangled, and then their body was disposed of by burning because no convicted witch could be uh, buried in consecrated ground. So it was not unknown for witches to be burnt alive, but that was only in extreme cases. The, the burning was really to dispose of the body, but they were strangled by the local locksmith, uh, Lockman rather. Um, and, and their ashes scattered, presumably. So, turning to the Trent cases, um, Trent seems to have conformed to the third and fourth epidemics of 1640-49 and 1659-1662. to 1652. In the year 1659, the arrest of 29 women and four men was typical of the kind of local trial authorised or not by the Privy Council. I should... Uh, I should explain that the Privy Council was the executive arm of the Scottish Parliament and it decided whether trials w or uh, uh, cases were, get were needed for, for trials, particularly of witchcraft. And what they would do was, uh, when a, a community applied for a warrant to try a, a witch, um, they would usually say, yeah, we, we'll try the witch. So they, the, tr the first trials were in the High Court in Edinburgh, but they were finding witches everywhere, so the Privy Council decided to put a lot of the, the cases to what were known as the, the um, Justice Heirs, and they were travelling courts. They went round all the counties, and even they were under pressure, so... Eventually, at the height of the second epidemic in 1628, they decided to allow communities to try their own witches. So it cost money to send a man on horseback from, say, Trenent, Dunbar. Um, 
to get a warrant and then the Privy Council would nominate the judges that were to be involved and they were always landowners or people with with money. Um, the interesting thing about the local trials was that um, the provost of the, the community was quite happy to conduct these trials because people could see that justice was being done and and the executions were being carried out. So it was to encourage people not to break the law and certainly not break God's law. So they were good for two reasons. They reduced the pressure on the, the official courts and um, it was local justice being... And of course, in those days, all executions were public, like football matches. So um, the witches that were taken into custody in 1659 appear in my book, The Deals In, and there is an appendix which shows you the, the process where one person would accuse others and there would be counter accusations. Um, so the process would go on. In the particular Trenent case of 33, well, 29 women and four men, of the 33, only some nine were actually executed. But you can bet your dollar that um, the others would be persecuted in some way or other. They may, they may have received branding, they may have been banished from the parish. Um, and in those days, the kirk was the the origin, originator of parish relief. So if you fell sick and couldn't work anymore, you applied to the church for parish relief. You weren't going to get it if you were a suspected witch, and certainly not if you were banished from the parish. Um, the minor problems, um, or the minor um, uh, events that happened was that, uh, and this happened later on in the witch hunt, when execution was no longer the answer, they put people in the stocks on market days and allowed the public to pelt them with rubbish and rotten fish. Anyway, um, we don't know the the outcome of that these trials other than that nine were executed. Um, an interesting feature of the trials was that um, particularly local trials, was that the authorities used the services of witch prickers. And Trenent boasts famously the most um, irresponsible witch pricker of them all, a guy called John Kincaid. John Kincaid was the Scottish witch pricker for want of a better description. Um, he advertised his wares to local communities, usually the provost of the, the town, and he examined women, mainly women, for the devil's mark. And the devil's mark could be anything. It could be a mole or a wart or a flea bite. And he used a, a preen or pin and it had a handle on it, and my theory is that when he pushed it into the witch mark that he found, uh, it retracted into the handle, and he was able to get paid a few shillings for his trouble. And of course he got paid for every witch that was executed, so it was a very lucrative business. A witch pricker um, had a, a preen or needle that he used to use when he searched for the devil's mark. The devil's mark could be anything from a mole to a wart to a flea bite. And what in that flea-ridden society didn't have flea bites on them, you know. Women were particularly vul vulnerable because they had long hair, so he searched in the hair in the eyebrows, under the armpits, and in the private places. And, you know, as a man, he probably got quite a kick out of it all, you know. Um, and if he found the devil's mark, he would put the pin in. And he'd usually put it in a spot that, allegedly, the victim couldn't feel. 
personally, I believe that the pin that he had had a handle on it and it was a retractable pin so that when he pushed it in, it looked as though the pin was going in, but it wasn't. It was retracting into the handle. However, that's that's a personal uh, belief, although there, there, there was a case of that being discovered in the north of Scotland. Anyway, it was in his interest to find witches because he got five shillings for every witch he pricked. And every witch that was executed, he got 20 shillings. So his patch from Aberdeen to Berwick was very um, was very commercially acceptable to him. And he ran the roost for many years until uh, he retired and handed over to somebody else who eventually, in the latter stages of the witch hunt, was discovered to be a charlatan. And they were charlatans, no, no question of it. So we have the witch pricker has found a witch, so the civil authorities hold a trial. And the sad thing about the Privy Council who issued the warrant for the trial is that if there were, say there had been a warrant issued for one trial, and in the course of that trial, persons named out with the trial would lead to a second trial, and the authorities thought, well, we've got a warrant for one doesn't matter how many trials we have. We can have three trials if we want and because the Privy Council didn't ask for the results. And this is why the records are so bad um, in that you, you find that suspects are named in the Privy Council registers but not the outcome. Although in some cases, there was a case in Dunbar where a lady called Catherine um, McTaggart was actually guilty of 27 uh, indictments and she was she wasn't tried once she was tried twice and the report was asked for by the Privy Council and when the first report came in saying that not proven they or, or some such verdict they said well you can dispose of her the way you want to so they decided to hold a second trial and the Privy Council didn't ask for the, the results but as she was repeatedly involved in the deaths of six people, she would probably be executed, although the records are silent on that. And the records for Trenen are, are no exception. There are, are quite a few trials that were held there that are not recorded. But the only the only way we know is that the trial that allowed the Trenen authorities to hold a local trial would name several suspects, and if they decided to hold subsequent trials, they didn't bother getting another warrant. So... That was that. Between 1563 and 1727, the powers of the Kirk were absolute in these trials. In turn, trials were held by the local church heritors, rich farmers and landowners who doubled as justices of the peace and whose word was law. It was also in their interest to find people guilty and hold a public execution to encourage their workforce to obey God's laws. Even after the last witch in Scotland, Janet Horne in Dornoch, was burnt alive in 1727 and the Witchcraft Act was largely repealed in 1736, trials still took place, but without execution. People could be whipped or branded, denied parish relief, put in the stocks every market day and sometimes banished from their parish. This happened well into the 19th century. It's um, interesting that the witch hunt lasted longer in Scotland than it did in England. Despite um, Charles the First or Charles the Sixth of Scotland and First of England attempt to strengthen the Witchcraft Act in, in England, um, up till then, Elizabeth I Act only allowed execution if a witch was found guilty of causing the murder or the death of an individual, whereas in Scotland it was enough to be accused of witchcraft and found guilty for execution. However, the numbers involved in England were with a population of 10 times that of Scotland, there were 1,500 um, cases that were recorded as executions. In Scotland it was three and a half to four and a half thousand. So why did the 
witch hunt last longer in England than it did uh, in Scotland than it did in England, simply because they kept ruled supreme. It was the answer to all kinds of strange behaviour and acts, um, and it dealt with cases of gossip, sexual harassment, adultery, where a man would declare a woman enchanted him to cheat on his wife or sweetheart, and of course superstition and even greed, and just plain old jealousy and hatred, aided and abetted by the Kirk, were responsible. It was a real Scotch broth of, of um, accusations. Um, I, th I find it particularly interesting that the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland in 1649 said that it wasn't the devil that was um, sending witches to punish um, the, his chosen people in the churches. It was God himself because they were sinning and it was a way of getting people to make sure that they came to the, the church on a regular basis and um, a good publicity stunt. I have my own views about the witch hunt. I have great sympathy for the people who were um, taken into custody and received more or less kangaroo justice. Um, there was no justice for these people. And I feel that although the witch hunt is long past and it is a very dark chapter in Scotland's history, the witch hunt continues to this day in different forms and different circumstances. I'm afraid that like the poor, the social habits of people are always with us. Um, it started when I was working on a history of Dunbar. I was doing the history of the local church and of course it dealt with various things like the pre-Reformation church, um, body snatching and of course the witch hunt. And the publisher who was working on it at the time said to me, have you ever thought of doing a, an old Scotland book on witches to see if there's a common theme in it? And very quickly we realised that the common theme was that it was a church-led um, uh, initiative and it was also about controlling the people, keeping them under control.